Brother Yoro, Dr. Devon Johnson, and Dr. Clyde Ledbetter, who are going to all speak to you for, a few, for about 10 to 15 minutes um, around their, their thoughts uh, related to Pan-Africanism and how Pan-Africanism in the past as well as presently um, is, is an essential part of, uh, of the black liberation struggle. And so um, you know, we'll, we'll jump in um, and I'll, I'll begin by introducing our first speaker, Brother Akil Parker is a teacher in the Philadelphia School District. He currently teaches mathematics at Overbrook High School. Within his 12 year teaching career, he has also taught the NFTE entrepreneurship course, as well as a course he has developed entitled African Americans in Philadelphia, affectionately renamed Black Philly, by his students at Delaware Valley Charter High School in 2011. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Finance from Morgan State University in 2003, and subsequently a Master's of Education at Lincoln University in 2015. He has two children, an 11-year-old son, Nassim, who's here with us today, and a four-year-old daughter, Asada. They are main inspirations for all of his work around education in the African community of Philadelphia. Much of his historical and cultural awareness has been facilitated by membership in organizations such as ASCAC, the Association for Study of Classical African Civilization, AAPRP, All African People's Revolutionary Party, and Independent African Center Institutions addressing every aspect of the existence of oh, student, and the African Heritage Studies Association. As a Pan-Africanist, he is a firm believer in the urgency and necessity of independent African Center Institutions addressing every aspect of the existence of African people. So Brother Hill Parker. Thank you. If I, if I could have permission from the elders to continue. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think I think that's important to, to highlight also because that is part of the, the African culture and African traditional system uh, that ties right into Pan Africanism. Um, if we're going to embrace Pan Africanism, we're going to embrace, embrace um, the cultural the cultural systems and the traditions. Um, I entitled my, my presentation Kwame Toure: uh, A Life of Pan Africanism. And I, I guess I was more so introduced to Pan-Africanism through Kwame Ture. I never met him in the physical realm, but through watching his, a lot of his lectures from the 1990s, um, listening to a lot of his speeches um, from the 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement, and also reading uh, his speeches, Dopey Speaks, uh, reading Black Power back in 2011, which changed my life, uh, his autobiography, Ready for Revolution, and just other information about him. So I want to use like this presentation, use his life and biographical information about him as a framework for um, the description of Pan-Africanism that I have. Of course, I can't do it real justice in 15 minutes. Um, you know, if it, this is any indication, this is all his autobiography, so I can't get through all this in 15 minutes. But I want to just highlight some, some things. And also, this also addresses genealogy. So I'm going to be talking about Kwame Torre, I'm going to be talking about Pan-Africanism, and also some other related factors and other related individuals that were you know, uh, instrumental at the same time and also were Pan-Africanists. What, what I'd like to do is start off with a definition that I take from this text, which was referenced by Kwame Ture in one of his speeches in Stokely Speaks. The text is Africa and Unity, the Evolution of Pan-Africanism, uh, published in 1969 by Vincent Vapetu Thompson, uh, a continental African scholar. And within there, he, he provides a definition of Pan-African Pan -African nationalism. Pan-African nationalism, a belief on the part of certain Africans or individuals of African descent that the continent of Africa is a national homeland, a desire that it be, number one, united, and two, independent under African leadership, an activity directed towards spreading that belief and desire. Herein, this phenomenon is referred to as, quote, Pan-Africanism, and an advocate as a Pan-Africanist. So, Again, Kwame Ture is a very important figure. I was uh, posthumously recruited into the AAPRP uh, with the, these brothers, Brother Yuru and uh, Brother Clyde, um, through just, like I said, watching Kwame Ture lectures, and I just wanted more information because one of the things that was central to all the things that Kwame Ture talked about was becoming part of an organization. And if not becoming part of an organization, to, to start an organization. Because he said, he stated that, he would all consistently state that the problem that African people have is that well, two main problems we have that are sources of our, of our problems are 
we lack organization and we lack knowledge. But we, we're definitely disorganized. And even a lot of times we talk about how mobilization that a lot of us often do often works to the ex at the expense of organization. So that's another thing that you know we need, we need to think about. Um, I also want to essentially give a shout out to KTS, which is the Kwame Ture Society, which was uh, founded at Howard University. There's some local uh, Philadelphia um, scholars, such as uh, Stephanie, they're not here today, but Stephanie, um, Asha, I know this is being taped, so I want to shout them out. Um, Stephanie, Asha Ray, uh, a sister named um, Shanice, who's actually in Ohio State uh, teaching right now, doing her PhD work, and a brother named Mike. Um, and they're, all, they're also all ASCAG members as well. Um, this, you know, the organization KTS, and that speaks right to what Kwame Ture talked about. And by him being also a Howard University alum, that's important that they were able to establish this organization. So, um, toward the end, of the, the end of my talk, I'm gonna highlight some excerpts from one of his lectures that he delivered in 1970 at Morehouse College called Entitled Pan-Africanism, also. And I titled my presentation, and I think this ties right into the theme of the of the conference, which is controlling our narrative, because I haven't read the book yet. I plan to read it, so maybe you know this is irresponsible of me to speak on it because I haven't read it in its entirety. But there's a book by Peniel Joseph entitled "Stokely: A Life," and I take issue with the book, the title itself, because number one, he changed his name. Kwame Ture changed his name from Stokely Carmichael to Kwame Ture in 1978. He doesn't transition until 1998. So that's a whole 20 years of his life where his name is Kwame Ture, and I think that represents his own ideological trajectory. And actually what I argue in this presentation is that Kwame Ture was a Pan-Africanist from birth, even if he didn't call himself that. And his actions and activities really highlight that, the fact that he was doing, he was active and living as a Pan-Africanist from his birth in 1941 in Trinidad and Tobago. So I think that it's, I think it needs to be addressed, and I wanna combat the idea that we can kind of like freeze frame or isolate Kwame Ture in as, a, as an American civil rights icon and just leave him there and make him part of this like American project, this fight for democracy, when I don't think that he was trying to do that anyway. I think he was trying to do what a lot of our ancestors have done and are still trying to do, which is be African. Because I think that's the issue. And that's one other, one other main thing I'm gonna talk about is that, you know, it's like, you know, when Malcolm talked about in the Battle of the Bullet, you know, if you're black, you were born in jail, you know, so we're gonna fight regardless. Like if we're black, we're gonna fight. The question, you can't escape that. There's no option that does not involve fighting in this nation and in, under Western and neo-colonialism for black people. The question is, in this country, are you gonna fight to be an American or are you gonna fight to be an African? So I think Kwame Ture was very distinct and clear, and a lot of us are very clear that we wanna fight to be African. And some of us wanna fight to be American, and that's your business, but, um, you know, no offense to Peter, but, you know, my dog's not in that fight, you know? Um, it's something I learned from my grandmother. Uh, but anyway, um, I'm going to start. So I'll start with uh, his birth in Port of Spain, Trinidad, June 29th, 1941. Trinidad is very important, I think, to Pan-Africanism because of other people that were also from Trinidad. George Padmore. I'll start off talking a little bit about George Padmore. George Padmore was a communist. George Padmore also went to Howard for a little while. Um, was a communist, but knew he was an African first. And when the Communist Party toured, he did a lot of writing for the, and spread a lot of propaganda for the Communist Party. He traveled around the world doing that, was in, spent a lot of time in Russia. But when the Communist Party tells him, okay, we need you to stop attacking Great Britain because we want to align ourselves with them, this is around World War II, and start attacking Germany, George Padmore says, no, uh, Germany doesn't have any African colonies right now, Great Britain does. So I'm not gonna stop attacking Great Britain. So then they tell him, well, you gotta go. So he says, all right, I'm out. You know, so he was very clear, like, I'm an African first. Like, I can, I can be down with y'all, but understand this. Like, we may have some interest conver convergence that, you know, um, Derrick Bell talks about. Uh, we, can have, we can have some of that, but I'm an African first, and I'm clear. So he's a, he's a, he's a Trinidadian. Also, C.L.R. James, um, famous writer of Black Jacobins and many other texts. And if we're talking about Pan-Africanism, Pan we have to understand Haiti. We have to understand the struggle of Haiti. We have to understand Dessalines. Um, I actually was in Tucson, he's a little more famous, but I think we need to look more into Dessalines if we're talking about Pan-Africanism because Dessalines was an another one, very clear, we're African, we need to just kill all of them because they've been killing us. The, the British, the Spanish, the French, they just all got to go. We're not trying to be a protectorate, we're not trying to be a French colony, we're not trying to do that. Um, and we can also look to uh, Jacob Carruthers, uh, The Irritated Genie. He goes into, I learned a lot about Dessalines more from, from reading that text. Also, we have Henry Sylvester Williams, also from Trinidad, 
one of the founders and organizers of the original uh, first Pan-African Congress that was held in Manchester, uh, Manchester, England. They were one of the first along with, organized along with Du Bois and I believe Alexander Promel and many other people. You also have Eric Williams from, from Trinidad. Eric Williams, who uh, came to the United States, became a professor at Howard um, on the AAPRP uh, book list, uh, Capitalism and Slavery, a very important text that talks about the economic aspects of the slave trade and of, of slavery. Um, Eric Williams, a funny story I learned from these brothers that when he became the president of Trinidad years later and became more of a, a reactionary, he actually banned many books, including his own book, Capitalism and Slavery. <laughs> You know, so that was, that's, that was interesting. I mean, it makes sense, but it, it just seemed funny to me. Uh, also, Tony Martin, Tony Martin, a scholar and a, a main historian of the Marcus Garvey movement and the UNIA ACL, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, a scholar that, you know, probably the, the, um, the, the foremost scholar of the UNIA ACL, also from Trinidad. So these are all, you know, important figures uh, from Trinidad. Um, and I think it's also important that our youth learn about these people because a lot of our youth, they know about Nicki Minaj. Nicki Minaj is, you know, is a made it famous, made it known that she has Trinidadian descent, but I think that these people have done more for our liberation than she has. So, but it's important, it's important to us to teach them about these people so that they can make their own comparisons and you know, decide who their heroes are gonna be. Um, then, age 11, he moves to, the, moves to Bronx, New York. So you see, like, again, like, I think this was important to like trace his movements and his migration throughout his life because that is Pan-Africanism, the, the idea that we are a global people and that wherever we are, we're still connected to the continent. So born in Trinidad, then moves to New York at age 11, um, around 1952, uh, which is incidentally the same year that Malcolm X is released from prison, so 1952. He, a couple things I wanna highlight about him moving to New York, and he went, he went to a high school called Bronx High School of Science, which is an elite high school very much like a, like a central high school here in Philadelphia or a uh, Masterman High School here in Philadelphia. That's the type of high school he went to. Um, shout out to my mom. My mom also, class of 78, went to Bronx Science. Um, so she's watching this, you know, I shout her out. Um, but the, the, the aim of those schools is to maintain the status quo. But one of the things that Kwame Ture talks about in that speech is he uses a Marxist analysis. And I don't want to privilege Marx, but we can use Marx's analysis in some, in some cases, in some instances. And one of the things Marx talks about is that if we are gonna get liberated, certain people in the, in the bourgeois class have to commit class betrayal. And these schools, like he could have easily just went to Bronx Science and then you know, been a, you know, a bourgeois Negro and went to, went to college, went to Howard um, with a lot of other people that he and many others were critical of for being bourgeois Negroes. He could have just went that route and not did all the work that he did to try to overthrow and replace this system. Um, but I think it's important that we look for examples like that of people that did go to these elite high schools and use these elite high schools to gain knowledge and gain information and gain critical thinking and then use it against those systems as opposed to use it to just assimilate into those systems. And I saw a connection to uh, Dr. Willis Huggins, who was an elder scholar and an elder actually or old head of Dr. the late Dr. John Henry Clark and also John G. Jackson, who wrote Introduction to African Civilizations, because Willis Huggins was actually uh, born in Selma, Alabama. He migrates to New York also. He's before Kwame Ture's time, but migrates to New York as well. He didn't also go to Bronx Science, but he went to Stuyvesant High School in Manhattan. Went to Stuyvesant High School in Manhattan, another type of school, just like, you know, similar part elite, you know, taking you know, the, the good blacks, the smart blacks, and try to educate them and get them to be the Black face of white power, another one of those types of types of schools. Um, but he again, he was a Pan-Africanist. He actually, in 1935, he uh, became the executive director of the International Council of the Friends of Ethiopia in response to Italy, fascist Italy, uh, Benito Mussolini and them bombing Ethiopia. So you know, and he's he's in New York. He be, he, be, he becomes that. He becomes leader of that. Let's fast forward to 1960. 1960. Uh, Kwame Ture enrolls at Howard University in Washington, D.C. He was in D.C. Uh, attending a protest. He met some Howard students. He started up a conversation with them. He finds out that they're protesting HUAC, HUAC, House, the House Un-American Activities Committee, who at the time was attacking Paul Robeson very heavily. Paul Robeson is a Pan-Africanist. Paul Robeson was involved in WASU, which is described in this book. Um, WASU is the West African Students' Union, which was held, which is housed in London. 
Paul Robeson is part of it. Later, uh, Kwame Nkrumah. 